Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our online worship service here at First United Methodist Church. This is the June 14th edition. Got some good news to share with you and some, well, not so good news. Uh, first of all, the good news, uh, Saturday morning, we had our annual conference via Zoom. It's the first time we've ever done that as an annual conference, and we are actually one of the first ever to do a Zoom, totally Zoom-based annual conference that went really well. And at the conclusion of that annual conference, uh, the appointments are read, and Denny and I are both returning to Harrison First United Methodist Church for this coming year. We're very excited about that. We're excited at what God is going to do in our church and what God is going to do in our community. And so we are excited to be a part of that journey with you. Now the not-so-pleasant news. Another part of the annual conference was our Episcopal leader, uh, Bishop Gary Muller, uh, announced that because of the precipitous rise in just the last couple of weeks of COVID-19 cases uh, throughout the state, uh, especially up here in Northwest Arkansas, even though it hasn't affected Boone County directly, at least not as far as we know, uh, he has made the decision that, that Arkansas United Methodist Churches will not move into stage two, which stage two closely resembles the governor's phase two, uh, and it includes gatherings of 50 people or less. He thinks, and I concur, along with our, uh, our conference staff and our district superintendent, that the risks are just too great for us to move into a larger gathering. So we will continue to do online worship. We're, we're hoping that, that, this will, uh, that this latest rise, as, even as precipitous as it may be, will, will flatten out pretty quickly. Uh, I don't want to put anybody at risk. I don't want to put uh, people that I love at risk, people that you love at risk. Uh, and in the meantime, we can continue to worship in this online format. So uh, that's the good news and the bad news for this week. Uh, we are very excited to, uh, to launch yet another year. I'm also excited to share with you that we're starting a new series starting this week. And it is based upon some of the issues that we're dealing with as a culture and as uh, a people of faith. And it is based on Micah 6, 8, which says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? And so for this week and the following two weeks, we're going to look at those three things. What does it mean to do justice? That's what we'll do today. What does it mean to love mercy? And then lastly, but certainly not least, what does it mean to walk humbly with God. Friends, would you join me in prayer as we begin this, this time of worship? God, I thank you for your good news. I thank you that your good news surpasses all other avenues, all other things, all the bad news, all of the, the distressing news, but your good news is over and above all. And so God, we come to hear the good news today, whether it be sung or prayed or proclaimed Lord, we're looking for your good news, and we're asking that you show up. We're asking that you show up in our homes and in our places of business, or maybe even in our cars, wherever we're watching, wherever we're listening to this message. We, Lord, I pray that your good news would break through. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence with us, and we thank you for your church. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Friends, let's join together in a time of worship. Let us 
unshakable hallelujah you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great. The psalmist writes for us this week from Psalm 100, and it's a few simple verses, five verses, but they are packed with good news. Psalm 100, verse 1, hear these words, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all of the earth, not just believers, but the whole earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Before we enter in, into a time of prayer, I do wanna share with you uh, uh, we had our administrative meetings this past week, and uh, in our finance and in our church council meetings, uh, we, we talked uh, very pointedly about the fact that uh, even though we are recipients of, uh, of the uh, Paycheck Protection Plan grant that helps to secure our staff and our, uh, and our utilities, uh, those monies are, uh, are quickly to run out. Uh, we have, uh, you have been faithful. Uh, let, me, let me just start off with that. You have been incredibly faithful even through this time of distance. And so I would urge you to continue to be so. Get online at uh, fumcharrison.org, click that giving link and it'll lead you through that, uh, that online platform. Or just write a check, drop it in the mail, or uh, if you desire, you can drop by the church and there's somebody here from eight to five every day. Monday through Friday, that is. We are incredibly grateful for your giving, but that being said, we are still uh, trailing behind our sustainable giving by about $1,000 a week. Uh, I encourage you to continue your faithful and regular giving. Use whatever means you so desire. And we are, uh, my family is continuing to do so. We give online. It's easy. It's uh, we set it up and we forget about it and we know that it just happens. And so we're grateful for you and for your continued faithfulness to Christ and to his church. And now let us pray together. Lord Jesus, this has been another week of struggle and heartbreak. There are those in our congregation and our community that have sustained loss and are dealing with grief and pain. There are those in our congregation who have dealt with health issues and who are still dealing with health issues. God, there are those in our congregation and in our community that are struggling with day-to-day -day existence. And God, there are those that are struggling with mental health issues and addiction and compulsive behaviors and simply not having a stable upbringing. God, for all of our concerns, for all of those 
that we name in our hearts before you and for all of those that we name out loud before you. We know that you hear us. God, I pray a special prayer this morning for all of my clergy friends and brothers and sisters and all of our United Methodists throughout the state and even throughout the nation as, as the time of either saying goodbye or saying hello to a, uh, a new pastor or one that uh, they have come to know and love is upon us. Those names that are read at annual conference do not represent just uh, ink on a page, but they rec represent families and they represent uh, households, experiences, churches. And so God, I would ask that you would grant your comfort to those who are leaving and also to those who are receiving. And this we ask in the name of Jesus, all that is before us, Lord, we lay it at your feet. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we move into our text for this morning, it comes to us from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Just a few short verses, but packed with a punch, let me tell you. Hear these words now. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I invite you to read that last line out loud together with me. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've been doing some blog reading of late and uh, a persistent topic that seems to surround our post-COVID-19 world, uh, well, our present COVID-19 world, is what our post-COVID-19 world might look like. Futurists are trying to predict things like social patterning and economic effects and biological trends and the like. And of course, there's more than a few doomsayers out there. You know, those that are uh, proclaiming that this is a sign of the end or a mark of the beast or a revisiting of the plagues of Egypt. But what all of these are doing, whether they're doing it from a, uh, from a theological perspective or from, from an economic or what have you, what all of these are doing, or at least beginning to do, is ask this question. What will the rest of my life look like? When it's all said and done, when this ends, if this ends, what does it mean going forward? Now, it's not an unfamiliar question. We ask a, a variety of those kinds of questions throughout our lives. We ask similar questions at the beginning of every calendar year. We call them resolutions. We think about what in the previous year we want to keep and what we want to throw away. We, uh, we think about uh, how we want things to be different in the coming year. I can tell you as I approach my 50th birthday this year, December 21st, by the way, uh, I've, I've been a lot more reflective on how I hope the next 50 years goes. Or like now, when we're facing a sea change of culture, it's important to ask what things go in the yard sale, what things do we want to keep, and what is given away. Pope Bronson wrote a book by a similar title, and it was called, What Should I Do With My Life? In it, he calls that question the ultimate question, the question to which all other questions bow. In his book, he profiles several people's life journeys in response to that question. Now, it's not a philosophical book. Instead, it's a look at the hard-earned record of those who actually took action, changed their lives, and enjoyed or suffered the consequences. Bronson gathers together stories of transformation from, from pointlessness to purpose, from success to significance, including things like these, a high-powered trial attorney who gave up his career in law after losing his wife to divorce in order to drive a truck so that he would be available for his son on weekends that he had visitation. A mother torn between her Olympic career and her adolescent daughter. The Cuban immigrant who overcame the strong disapproval of her parents and quit her lucrative career so that she might go into social work and help those who were less fortunate than, than she. And the obstetrician who walked away from her destiny of being a doctor and was just trying to make sense of it all. See, the more you read Bronson's book, the more you begin to understand that there are millions of people out there that are desperately seeking an answer to the ultimate question. Those answers don't often come easy. 
Usually there's pain and risk and adversity, some struggle involved. And often the vision for the future only comes to us through the lens of hindsight. The prophet Micah is a kindred spirit to those who are pursuing life's ultimate question. As he wrote about the people of Israel, they were in crisis. Micah's focus was to simplify, let's, let's boil it down to the essence, to remind the people of their purpose. Like an executive who wastes time on a corporate treadmill over and over again, or a doctor who's given all she had to give, the people of Israel had been relying on their busyness, on their patterns, on their rituals, on their status as chosen people of God to make meaning of their lives. Their offerings to God were simply the fruits of their frantic labor, much like those of us who believe that if we can just do enough and give enough and work enough, then God, our boss, our families, our friends will finally be happy with us. But Micah breaks it down for us. The answer to the ultimate question is really quite simple. See, our purpose is found in the larger purposes of God. Did you hear that? Let me say that again. Our purpose, the answer to our ultimate question, our purpose is found in the larger purposes of God. What does the Lord require of you? Asks the prophet. What really matters? When we boil all of the dross away, when, when everything that's left is just the pure nugget, what really matters? He says these three things, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's what we're going to look at for the next few weeks, and specifically we're going to look at the first one today, and that is to do justice. Now Micah is a minor prophet. Minor prophets don't mean that they were uh, under the age of 18. Uh, they don't mean that they're diminutive in stature. They don't mean that, uh, that they were less important than the major prophets. What they mean is that they were not as long-winded. They just didn't have quite as much to say and they packed in what they needed to say in fewer words. Another minor prophet named Amos in chapter five says almost exactly the same thing that Micah said, I hate, I despise your religious feasts, he writes. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Several years ago, back in 2007, we took a family vacation up to the, uh, the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. We did a lot of fishing. Uh, we didn't do a lot of catching that week, but we did a lot of fishing and we had a lot of fun with family. And one of the things that we did was we went to the Mississippi River. We crossed over the Mississippi River, but it wasn't on a bridge. No, it was on a log. It was about six feet wide. The headwaters of the Mississippi are just a trickle, just a, a little small insignificant creek coming out of, uh, of, a, 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 of a little pond, of a, a lake. But I want you to think about that for a second. That little insignificant creek that when in the, in the height of the dry season, you can actually straddle it and say that you actually have straddled the Mississippi having one foot on each bank. But I want you to think about this. The headwaters of the Mississippi continue south. And as they continue south, other small streams and tributaries intersect it. Other minor rivers add to it. And by the time you reach just a few hundred miles south, it is the mighty Mississippi. See, the image of a rolling stream to Amos is a very appropriate one. For justice is 
in one person just a, a trickle, but as it's joined by other streams of justice and begets further justice, one small trickle inspires other acts of justice and so on and so on, and justice turns into a mighty ever-flowing river. And so Amos says, let justice roll down like waters, an ever-flowing stream. See, we were witness to that uh, just the last two weeks. And I don't know why we haven't picked up on it sooner, but this, this last round of justice-seeking river creation was peaceful and powerful. And the headwaters were in Minneapolis. And those headwaters gained traction and gained steam and justice fed into justice, which fed into justice, which fed into justice, and a mighty river overswept our nation. I hope that this will create a permanent change, a sea change in our nation, as justice is enjoined to justice, and it becomes a mighty flowing stream. Now, I'm not talking about the rash acts of a few that would seek to divert justice, or even mock justice. I'm talking about the persistent flow of justice that brings about sustained, real change in our lifetimes. Back to Micah. Micah commends us that we are to do what is right. We are to do what is right. One of my seminary professors said that the difference between a leader and a manager is a manager makes, thing, makes sure things are done right, where a leader makes sure the right things are done. We are called to be leaders in this case. We have to make sure the right things are done. We can't just keep making sure that, that we do things right. We have to make sure the right things are done. That's where we find Micah in this passage. If you've spent even a little bit of time studying Micah, you'll see that uh, he was one of the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. He was a contemporary of Hosea and Isaiah and Amos, said similar things that these prophets said. Micah was preaching at what we'll call the end of the good times, just before the nation fell apart. They had had 40 years of prosperity and wealth and peace. And I don't know about you, but in prolonged periods of prosperity and wealth and peace, people tend to forget that God is the source. People get caught up in the, the good life and they begin to forget God and his ways. And so here we are, just at the end of the good times, just before the fall of Israel and Judah, and the, and the prophet Micah speaks to the people. We sometimes worry that we are living in this moment in our nation's history, that we might be at the end of the good times, at the apex, just before the country starts to fall apart. Because, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an awful lot of unrest today. There is mistrust, political mistrust, racial mistrust, judicial mistrust, religious mistrust. We're seeing the fracturing, the crack even now, division, acts of violence and hate. And we're almost at the point where the shocking doesn't shock us anymore. What was once shocking has now become normal. And we are acting out as if we have no part in its creation nor in its solution. So it was in the time of Micah. And that's why we need to hear this timeless and simple word of Micah today. What does the Lord require of you? What does God want from you? First, it's important to know what God doesn't want from us. And Micah tells us. God essentially responds, you're asking what I want, you're asking what I desire. And your assumption is that I want you to focus on your relationship with me through religious practice. That's what Israel first thought. <laughs> Another sermon about money. Thanks, God. But then the prophet goes into the possibilities, and honestly, they sound absurd. Would you take a year-old calf as a burnt offering? The choicest, 
Would you, well, is that not enough? Well, then maybe 10,000 rams. How about 10,000 of your rams? How about then uh, 10,000 rivers of oil? Or maybe your firstborn. You think I want all that stuff? You think I want your, you think I want your sacrifice? God spoke of these things, but the absurd amount of oil and the uh, offering of the firstborn are, are hyperbole for the sake of emphasis. He's trying to get through our thick skulls. He doesn't want any of that. He doesn't want ritualistic sacrifice. That doesn't please God. So what does please God? He says it. Do justice. Now, when you look through the Old Testament, especially, there's nine words that are associated with the word justice. Widow, fatherless, orphan, poor, hungry, stranger, needy, weak, and oppressed. In this list of words, you did not find the word rich, so you don't have to worry about the rich, because the rich will be able to afford justice. What we need to concern ourselves with are the widows, the fatherless, the orphan, the poor, the hungry, the stranger, the needy, the weak, and the oppressed. We are to do justice for the people of the world who cannot do justice for themselves. Justice, by the way, is not the same thing as equity. Equity means that everybody gets the same thing. Everybody gets an equal share. Justice means that everyone gets a fair share. Doing justice is also different from being compassionate. I remember the story from Charles Dickens, England, some 200 years ago. At that time, many young boys and girls were working in the coal mines. Their life was miserable, but that was what was expected of poor children in those days. A life of work in coal mines that began as early as age six and would sometimes last 16 hours a day. The church would offer presents at Christmas time to the children that were working away in the coal mines. The church would offer charity and turkeys to the poor families at holiday time. The church would offer prayers for the little ones working away in the coal mines. But then there was Michael Thomas Sadler, an early Methodist, by the way, who was a member of the British Parliament. And he worked to see that laws were changed so that children could no longer work in extreme conditions for extreme hours, and the law insisted that instead they go to school. Well, my children are kind of not a fan of him, but um, I'm sure they would be even less of a fan of working in a coal mine. But see, what we need to understand is that charity is giving Christmas presents at Christmas. Charity is giving turkeys away for holidays. Charity is saying prayers for little children. But justice is working to change the laws, to protect and to provide for those who could not do so on their own. Micah and his partner prophets in the Old Testament are perfectly clear that the follower of the Lord does justice. Moses said, justice and only justice you shall follow. The psalmist said, God loves justice and righteousness and steadfast love. Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And Micah, do justice. What does the Lord require of you? Do justice. I see, justice is, is sometimes perceived as a passive thing. It's something we desire to, you know, let happen, let justice roll like waters. Something that we have no power really to affect. We can support it. We can shake our heads when we see the absence of it, but we do little to attain it. But that's not what Micah calls us to. What Micah is calling us to is action. It's not something that just happens. It's something that doesn't occur by chance Justice is something that we do. We must do. And we must not make the 
mistake that our allegiance to a particular political party or social cause or religious organization or fraternal club equals to doing justice. Just because you pay your dues or pay your tithe or whatever else you may pay doesn't mean you've done justice. All it means is that you pass the buck. You pass the responsibility of doing justice to someone else and you have fooled yourself into thinking you've done justice yourself. See, to do justice means this, to act toward God and man according to the divine standard of righteousness that is revealed in his word. It means to speak and act for those who cannot speak and act for themselves. It is not activism, which by definition mean, it means using vigorous campaigning to bring about change. It is action. German pastor Martin Niemöller was a prominent Protestant pastor who emerged as an outspoken public foe of Adolf Hitler. He spent the last seven years of, his, of Nazi rule in concentration camps. And his most, most famous quote is as follows. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. See, what God is saying what I, is, is what I really want. What I really want is for you to put all of your energies towards the work of justice, to care for the vulnerable, to make sure that the widow and the orphan are loved and they're, they're treated with dignity. By doing the hard work of caring for your neighbor, then you'll find out what your true purpose is. Friends, justice begins only after we start to see people as God's beloved children. Loved, cherished by God, just as we are loved and cherished by God. And once we understand that, then once we begin to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly in a way that pleases God, then we draw closer to the answer to that ultimate question. And friends, this is the good news for today that makes a difference. Let us pray. God, show us the way. Show us how to do justice. Show us in our everyday walking around normal lives, whether that's walking around the house or walking around uh, at our job, where, wherever these days and times allow us to walk around. Lord, wherever you, uh, wherever you find us, show us. Show us the way to do justice in your world. It may be the neighbor across the street. It may be as next as it may be as close to us as the person in our own home. Lord, show us the way to do justice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
Friends, I hope that you have enjoyed this time of worship. Uh, do me a favor. Uh, if you did enjoy it, uh, drop us a line. Drop us a line to let us know if you have a prayer request that we can, uh, that we can intercede for you. Drop us a line to let us, just simply let us know that you, uh, that you heard today. Or what I'd love to hear is drop us a line to share how God has revealed how he desires for you to do justice in your everyday walking around life. Let me encourage you that God's purpose for us is simple. And our purpose in the world is simple. It's that because of God's incredible love for us that he shows through Jesus Christ, we go forth to know God with all of our minds, to love God with all of our hearts, and to serve God with all of our strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What does the Lord require?